Okay. Um, well, greetings, everybody. My name is John Harris. I'm the founding editor of Politico, uh, joining you from Washington, D.C. Uh, today. And uh, I don't, uh, I'm making sure so somebody will, I think, post a comment, please, if uh, to the messages, if we're not coming through loud and clear. Um, uh, but we've got a panel today on a, uh, a vital topic, which is um, uh, searching for a stable geopolitical geopolitical order in the wake of the uh, Ukraine conflict. It's quite broad uh, and spacious conflict, and I've told my panelists that we're going to use that as latitude to uh, take this in whatever direction most animates the, the individuals. Uh, but we'll need some help from the audience and those active in the room also for, for uh, conversa conversations about that. Uh, the place my mind went uh, with, with uh, Frank uh, Jorgen Richter's um, uh, uh, topic there was the question of whether uh, this we are now in 2022 in something like where the, the liberal West was in 1946, 1947, uh, uh, in the wake of World War II. And it was clear that we, uh, we were then in the beginning of a Cold War. We didn't know how long it would last, but we could foresee that it was a decades-long contest of uh, different ideas, different political orders, different power systems. Uh, and that uh, Cold War influenced uh, everything relating to national security. Uh, 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 it, it shaped the, uh, the, the commercial landscape. Uh, it shaped the academic landscape. It was an organizing principle for, for liberal society. We ended that Cold War about 30 years ago. Are we now in a new one, a new contest? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the conflict in Ukraine has shined a light vividly on uh, uh, our, our, uh, the clash of values uh, and interests uh, be between the West and, uh, and, and Vladimir Putin's Russia. But, of course, probably the more consequential uh, uh, competition over time is uh, with Beijing and a different system uh, uh, with different animated by different values in China. So anyway, that, that's what uh, uh, where my mind went. And I think I just for starters to go around our panel, um, I, I would pose that question and invite you to give me your take on that. Um, uh, are we should we be thinking of this as a new Cold War or is that not a useful frame of reference Um uh, uh, you know, the, the past can sometimes illuminate, but sometimes it can distort. Uh, and, and maybe we should be thinking of this differently. I, I'm just going to go uh, clockwise on my screen uh, and uh, ask uh, Jane Warwand, who's the, uh, the founder and uh, uh, chief visionary. That's a fam fabulous uh, title. Uh, uh, one I hope to have myself someday of, uh, of Dermalogia. Uh, Dermalogica, excuse me. And uh, um, give us your perspective on this, um, uh, if you could, Jane. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, you know, my background is as an entrepreneur and also an immigrant. I'm based in Los Angeles now. I travel around the world usually, although not for the last couple of years as much. Uh, and we, you know, built an industry in the salon professional business, 98% uh, women. So this is an industry dominated by women and entrepreneurship. My focus on going forward, where do we go from here? I don't really believe in the new normal. I think it will be the new next. And, I, and my focus is always on jobs. And uh, I think when people have, have work and they can put food on the table and look after themselves, support themselves, that is a game changer. And as we see a move of uh, people around the world, not just because of the, like in the Ukraine situation and, and previously with the Syrian situation, so much movement of human beings because of conflict, but we're also going to have movement of human beings because of climate change, because of food shortages and food differences. I think we're going to see on our planet a completely different landscape of, of human people, human beings moving around. And to make that, facilitate that movement and encourage it and support it, there has to be jobs. So my focus is on skill set training, how are we putting people to work? What are they going to do for work? And can we make sure that when they land in a brand new environment, they are able to support themselves and gain that ability to uh, focus on their own future and, and stability? Okay. A number of threads that we can pull on in the balance of our conversation with that. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Andreas Fibig, who's the, uh, yeah. I think, former uh, CEO of, uh, uh, of uh, IFF. Is that right? Yes, international flavors, flavors and fragrances. We are the, the biggest ingredients and, and fragrance uh, player player in the industry. Uh, yeah, for me, it, it's actually it's more complicated than than than, uh, than the old Cold War. I'm actually born and raised in Berlin, in West Berlin, during the times of the Cold War. So that's still 
I have a lot of memories. And, and after this conflict in Ukraine started, I, I think it brings back bad memories. But I believe the situation is much more complicated these days than it was before because we have many more players uh, on the chess field. We have the Chinese and we have uh, a, a lot of countries which are not any longer, let's say, Western democracies or pure dictatorships. We have in-between countries, I would say like Turkey, for example. And if I take the, uh, uh, um, the commercial angle, that means for us, if you run global companies where you need supply chains, you need investments in different geographies, you can't be too dependent on one country. And I've seen it uh, over and over again that, that many companies have invested a lot in China ourselves as, as well. Um, but now you see with everything which is happening with COVID, the shutdown, the, the longer periods, how they go about it and how they basically block their harbors, that this is disrupting. So for us in the commercial world, it means you need always to think twice how you invest and where you invest your money, where are stable systems, and how do you basically organize yourself that you always have a plan B and C to be able to serve, uh, serve your customers. So that's what I would say. And what I regret now with this conflict, unfortunately, that we have many more crises like climate, like food, like we're just coming out of COVID. And it takes, unfortunately, the focus out of these uh, very important crises as, as well for the world. So that's what I would Thank say. Thank you. Uh, Dean Batts uh, from Arizona State University, uh, and like myself, uh, 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 a, a journalist. Where do you come at this uh, this question? Uh, well, thanks, John. Um, the way I look at it is really the importance of, let's just say, journalism and media and communications writ large as part of the fabric of a healthy community, healthy, healthy democracy, healthy, you know, governments uh, in, in interaction and giving power to the people to uh, hold, hold government accountable and to really be, uh, to create cohesiveness uh, amongst people. And I think that what we've seen, I, I never like to use the, the uh, term decline of journalism. What I, what I like to say is the changing um business model of journalism, which John, you're very familiar with, uh, that this, the changing business model of, of journalism has, you know, created uh, fissures that have been exploited. And I, I think that if we can exploit those fissures and look, in, look in, um, for positive opportunities, I think there's opportunities for us to create more global co cohesiveness that expands beyond the boundaries of in one country and that we can really, um, you know, bring our, bring bring uh, us all together here because we have been divided in so many different ways, and and that has been again been exploited with misinformation. I think that um, there is an opportunity to to move in the other direction, and perhaps what we're seeing uh, with the Ukrainian uh, war and the way that some people have responded against. The information that you know that Russia has put out about what this really was all about, you know, that was really inspiring as a journalist to see some of the people doing their own journalism and doing their own um, putting out their own information about this. So I like to see this as a glass half full and opportunity here, and sort of going if we are going back to Cold War uh, type of era, that might be good for for journalism and media because one thing we know about that is that there was there was more trust. Uh, in media back in those days. So I hope we do go go back to that uh, in terms of where we put the role of media in our society. Sure, that's true. Although, And when I talk about a global clash of values, though, I would say uh, journalism is one era, uh, area. We're in competition against uh, power centers in Moscow and in Beijing and other places around the world simply don't believe in the notion of uh, transparent societies or free reporting uh, um, uh, or accountability for governments. Um, but let's return to that. And uh, 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 Sally, you're joining us uh, uh, from Colorado, uh, yes. the president and co-founder of Global Choices. Uh, give us a quick thumbnail of what that is and, and what your take is on this question of uh, what kind of global order are we, is, waits us. Uh, yeah, in the okay. The so Global Choices is an international intergenerational organization that is uh, focused on 
uh, climate change primarily and specifically what's happening in the Arctic with the Arctic ice shield, Arctic Ocean ice shield, um, because we have a global indispensable planetary cooling system that's unraveling uh, at, at this moment in time on, on our watch. So, uh, and the global implications of being complicit in letting that melt are um, catastrophic, literally catastrophic. So um, this particular topic is really interesting because, to me because we were very different than post-World War II. Um, we didn't have climate change then. And this is, uh, from, from my point of view, um, this is going to change everything. We talk about organizing principle um, uh, around politics. I think, I think uh, the world order immediately after there will be a truce of some sort at some point with Ukraine and the world order, there'll be a standoff between Russia and, and um and the United States, China is uh, is in trouble in many ways. How they surface their economy, uh, how they deal with climate change. They're supposed to level off on fossil fuels by forty forty five. They're building. They're still using coal. They're still using fossil fuels. Uh, a tremendous amount, but they're supposed to level off and be on renewables after that point. But they have millions of people, supply chain problems, millions of people are, um, you know, under <clears throat> under lock and key, et cetera. And I think that this will prevail for a time. But climate change is going to trump it all. Because, and we're going to, we're going to find reorganization. I can't remember who said it, but um, um, I think you did, uh, Jane, but there are going to be climate refugees right now. If you look at the impacts of losing the ice shield, which is the albedo effect on the planet, uh, it's now linked to almost everything we're experiencing in climate change more severe droughts in Africa, the, the uh, Pacific Northwest heat dome that literally boiled, boiled a billion organisms in the tidal zone along the coast. Yeah. And fires in California now are linked to that. Changes in the Gulf Stream, which is slower now, is linked to Arctic ice loss. Uh, uh, ice loss. And the jet stream, now is very wobbly and that's because linked back to sure. ice so as these changes take place there's approximately two billion people that will be affected and this includes sea level rise too will be affected directly or indirectly by climate change two billion people mm -hmm. so that means that where, where I think we're going to have to go because food scarcity is going to become a reality. Conflicts are going to be unmanageable because they're going to be everywhere for the very basics of life. So keeping a focus on what is happening. And we actually have a very detailed, um, there is a chance to save this, this ice shield. Uh, the so Sally, before uh, just to make sure we get Murad in here because there's yeah. so much there in your in your yes. intro that we're going to want to return to. Sorry, me, sorry. Uh, well, the, one thing that, a, yeah. the one last thing I'd like to say is that I think climate science is going to determine security, and climate yeah. science, climate science is also um, and how that security looks. That's how the world order is going to have to shift in the future. I, uh, it's funny. I was, that was on my list to follow up with you as, as once we finish these opening statements, because uh, I heartily agree with you on that. Murat, uh, you gave me permission to not. Uh, uh, whoops, where did Murat go? I think he may have wobbly connection here. I'm expecting we'll get him back in a moment. Um, I'm going to say uh, just for um, uh, our audience, we've got a number of people in the room. Uh, do by all means uh, uh, send in uh, 
a comment or a question for the panel, we welcome it. I think there's a rat. You're, you're back. I'm with maybe a wobbly connection, but we've got you now. Uh, uh, you've heard, Oh, there you went again. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the place I'd like to um, um, go and maybe I'll send this. Uh, I'd be curious uh, uh, what you think, uh, Andreas, because the, the implications of, of Sally's uh, um, comment about climate and the cat, uh, the kind of, slow motion, increasingly fast motion catastrophe that it represents, but decades in the, in the making and it's going to mitigation and, and, uh, 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 and hopefully halting that is going to be a decades long process. Um, I am going to turn to you, but now that we've got Murat, I want to make sure we get him in here. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Uh, yes, uh, because I am now on the Caspian Sea coast in the, in yeah, Azerbaijan, right. in the city ha, called Baku. Have you been hearing us okay with your with your somewhat tenuous connection? Uh, I, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yes. just, uh, we, we've had a um, mixed, uh, 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 as I've heard it, from kind of optimistic views of uh, how people can manage the new security uh, order to, if I may, a, a, a somewhat... Uh, if not pessimistic, certainly a very chastening one from Sally, that this is a, the, the reality of climate change is going to drive every security issue uh, and it's going to infuse uh, basically every arena of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of free society and, and autocratic ones alike in the, the future ahead. But what's your view on this? We traded emails before and I, I sense from you a little bit more optimism about the future and the possibilities for this new security landscape. Did I, did I discern that correctly? Uh, yes, uh, generally, yes. Uh, I am Murat Sietnipesov. I am the chairman of the Caspian Week Forum, uh, which we are doing every year in Davos, every January, except 2020 and 2021. Uh, I am also on the business side, uh, and that's why I could see from uh, several angles uh, what is going on. And here I have a bit of pessimism, uh, because unfortunately today all scenarios are possible. Even catastrophic and crazy scenarios, but uh, we should hope for the best. Uh, and uh, let's start maybe from the Cold War story. And uh, I think Cold War already started. Uh, but uh, the difference is with the Cold War after World War II and uh, today's Cold War is, uh, first of all, there are several players on the map, uh, several superpowers. I think Andreas already mentioned this. Uh, and uh, this could lead uh, again to the various uh, outcomes, uh, but uh, I think that in the short and mid-term uh, perspectives, there will be several zones of influence. Uh, and one zone, Western world, United States, Western Central Europe, and uh, some other countries, uh, there will be a Chinese zone, which is China, East, uh, East Asia, and a big part of Africa. Uh, and also the smallest one by, by population, but probably the biggest by the territory, it will be Russian zone of influence, which is uh, Russia and uh, some of CIS countries uh, like Kazakhstan and other countries. And, uh, but this uh, situation will not be stable for a long time because world changed. Now we're in the 21st century and you cannot uh, exist uh, without any connection with the other parts of the world. Like it's happened with the Soviet Union after World War II, more or less 20, 30 years, country was isolated. But Soviet Union, that time, there was the second superpower. Today's situation is much different. This is a little bit of pessimism. Uh, now let's go into the optimism. And uh, uh, I think that the uh, world uh, developed a lot. Technology, uh, and even especially digital technologies, developed a lot. And now, uh, with uh, rather small resources, and uh, which was the topic of the session, whether we need to allocate resources from the war, which is uh, very stupid and uh, rather needed, for, rather useless, uh, to something good to improve the life of the people. And here, I think uh, now with the international organizations' efforts, even on the public-private cooperation. Uh, partnership schemes, uh, we could really get a lot. And for example, uh, even us, which were quite far away from the geopolitics, we are working on the system for preparedness uh, for the next pandemic. It's uh, like uh, we would like to be able to detect in the earliest, earliest possible stage epidemiologically dangerous pathogens like viruses, bacteria, and so on. And uh, there are a lot of initiatives in the world. 
uh, on the business side, on the uh, government side, also on the national organization side. Uh, that's why I'm uh, going with optimism to the future. Okay. But uh, we should overcome this quite mid, uh, short, short term or maybe mid term period of these zones of influence and everything will be back to normal. All right. Thank so you. I'm going to try to, in our remaining 25 minutes, see if I can um, um, summon some of that optimism. I must say, I find it hard uh, in, the, uh, uh, in my reading uh, of the facts to, to, to particularly. Oh. Oh. Did we lose our moderator? Yeah, we lost. We lost you, John. No. Yes. Well, John, if you don't come back, <laughs> I'm back. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> well, I'm gonna wobble, but, uh, uh, but Jane and Andreas, uh, and then I'm going to also uh, uh, return to Pentino in, in a bit. Uh, many of the, uh, the the crises that have mentioned beyond the narrow security uh, crisis in Ukraine are clearly global in character. Um, uh, climate change obviously be, uh, uh, being the case, but I would say many of the other big problems we face uh, um, in management of technology and uh, uh, the humane applications of, of new understandings in, in healthcare and in science, all those are global in, in character. Uh, and, and so if the problem's global in character, so too must the remedy uh, be, uh, be global in character. I mean, th- that's where my optimism uh, is uh, really gets tested. Uh, that it, it seems to me we've got global problems, but without a global polity and, and increasingly a clash of values that doesn't even allow us common grounds uh, for uh, for discussing the issues or even acknowledging uh, um, the nature of the of reality. We saw that in COVID with the, the differences between the West and China. Um, um, I respond to what we've heard, uh, 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 Jane and, and, and Andreas both, and then I want to, after that point, go to, uh, to Dean Batt. Well, what, I agree. What, what, as Sally painted that, that picture, it, it was, it, I mean, it, of course it's alarming, and we should be alarmed, and we should be actually even more alarmed because we, we know this. I, 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 I know that, you know, Sally painted a portrait of, of our world, and I think that we all could nod and think, oh, yeah, we've heard this. We know this. But so what are we doing about it? And the movement of people is going to be, uh, we can't control that. It's, you know, we can talk at a top level of how do we, you know, increase our dialogue? How do we support each other? But once people are forced to move, as we've seen in Ukraine right now because of, of conflict, but also there will be movement and there already is through climate Sally mentioned the wildfires. I'm here in California and they just told, we've just been told by our governor that we don't have a fire season any longer. Our fire season always used to be quite defined by hot winds that come in and and fan the flames, literally. It's now year round. And even on a very local level, you know, we can talk global, but very locally, people who were burned out in the fires in California over the last three years, myself included uh, in Santa Barbara, You were just forced to literally pick up and run. So you better understand that this is not going to be something we can control. It's going to be something that's going to happen and we wish we could control. We have to tackle it at the root source, as Sally said. But the people that are moving are going to have to support themselves. And I would like to see a a a global focus on job creation and especially through skill set training. And let me tell you why. Because when Angela Merkel admitted a million refugees from Syria... Everyone was, was, how are they going to work? What are they going to do? The people who had skill sets got work pretty quickly, and everyone who didn't was put through the amazingly strong and, and robust apprenticeship programs in Germany. And they are all now working. When you have a skill set that you can literally travel with if you have to, you can start working pretty quickly, even if you speak the language or not. So whether it's in tech, whether it's in in vocational training, whether it's in construction, we have 20 million jobs open in the US. Build Back Better can't even happen if we don't get skilled workers. So I'd love to see the governments replicate what we have seen traditionally in Europe with skill set training and apprenticeships. And let's make sure that we're not just educating our future, but we're also equipping them to be self-sufficient. Maybe, John, let me, let me build on what, what Jane just said. And I, I tend to agree with, with Sally on, on the climate crisis because 
that will be the overarching threat for for all human beings and and we have to face it so let's be uh be practical on 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 the corporate side what what we certainly could could do in in in, in corporate life is first of all making sure that we reduce our CO2 emissions as much as, as we can. And I actually believe that the corporates have much better levers than many of the governments because many of our companies are global companies and we have an impact also on our suppliers and our, our customers. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's one thing and that's what we have done in the, in, in the last 10 years quite, quite significantly from windmills to solar power uh, and even... We have parts of our R&D and it's in New Jersey, you believe it or not. And the whole R&D is almost powered by solar panels in New Jersey. So it, it can, be, can be done. So that's number one. Number two is, and it depends to the nature of the business. In my business, in ingredients, we have done a lot of work to reduce the, uh, uh, the animal prote- proteins because we have done a lot of research on plant-based proteins, whether it is pea or soy-based proteins, mm-hmm. and help the Beyond Meats and, and other of these companies to come up with their products because obviously that has a very positive impact on, on, on climate as well. Then with our customers, which are the PepsiCo's or Unilever's of the world, we are working actively on food security. How can we make sure that, first of all, we compensate the farmers in third world countries in the right, in the right way? Because, Jane, I, I, I agree with you. Education is important, but to pay fair, let's say, the, the fair share for these people as, as well, that, that they do their, their work in, in, in these countries is important. Or helping them even with, uh, with, with, with schooling, whether it is in, in Madagascar or, or some of the other, other areas where, where we are. I think that's what the private sector can do. And we can also push the politicians in the right in the right way. By the way, because you're such such a fan of the dual education system in, in, in Germany, I'm I'm a bit more pessimistic on what happened with it, one million Syrians. But anyway, still the system is a robust system. And as a chairman of the German American Chamber of Commerce here in New York, we have introduced the system to the U.S. We are now working in the uh, tri-state area with some of the community colleges to basically bring the system uh, to the U.S., which is complicated because in the U.S. everybody thinks the college education is the only way to be educated. But I think here everybody, all of us, can do more to help the governments to move in the right way. So that's just a couple of very practical things, I would say, from the, from the, corporate, uh, from the corporate side. Yeah. So, uh, Bettina, the, the question of, uh, of information... And really what we're talking about is, is uh, uh, the ability to um, um, establish kind of common facts in, in, in debate. Uh, you know, we, we, I think you and I both grew up under the uh, notion of journalism. It was a journalist's job to uh, illuminate as best we can certain uh, uh, objective realities, and knowing that then there would be a big argument about the implications of those facts. But there, there was shared facts. And I, I, I think w- what we see in certainly the United States, many liberal democracies, uh, um, is a breakdown in that belief in shared facts, and in, in, in uh, um, uh, other countries with autocratic systems, uh, the, even the notion of that, uh, uh, the, the pursuit of shared facts, is John, is not an here. accepted idea. Uh, right. The government controls information, and they punish centers. <clears throat> Look, what is the role of journalists on, on these? Uh, um, um, in, in this new order that we're, we're describing with multiple security, environmental forums. So I'll take it. I think, we're, I, think I know where John was going. Uh, uh, so what's emerging now is uh, what I would call a new model of journalism, which really is, I don't want to call it post-objectivity, but, but I would say it's, it's one where we are not so tied to both sides and really presenting both sides when something uh, is wrong. We really are now moving towards a model where we actually call things out for being wrong as they are, and not really try to say, "Okay, well, we try to present both sides." On uh, in a case where it's obvious that you know that what we're covering here or what or we're part of this is is clearly wrongdoing, or the facts are wrong, or the perspective is just far out of line with where we want to be as a society. So I think that what we're going to see happen. Um, is an emergence of a, what I would call 
again, I, I didn't want to use the term, but we'll say sort of a post uh, post objective or post objectivity uh, brand of, of journalism. There will always be uh, a need for the, the type of journalism that we have known, John, but but this concept of uh, of objective journalism is actually a uh, a 20th century construct uh, that that sort of existed sort of post World War II. But if we were to go back uh, a bit, you know, there was there were lots of different perspectives uh, that were out there uh, in 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 the journalism realm and sort of presented all all ideas. And so I think we're I think we're going uh, back to that. Then the other thing I think that's going to need to happen is uh, is that journalism is going to have to take a role of really more solutions based journalism and really not only pointing out what's wrong but what's what's happening in terms of problem solving what you know you know where are the best ideas what's working and how do we shine a light on what's working so that people can perhaps ad- adopt some of those um, some of those successes and really apply them in uh, in their areas or in, in their communities. And really, you know, so a journalism that's more participatory, that's more part of, more uh, in touch with the people, uh, that listens to people and really, again plays a role of wanting to be involved in moving society forward and not just playing this role where we're just, we're just here as objective observers. I think that we are beyond that. And I think that in, in a sense, sort of taking that sideline of ob- objective role has over time, I think hurt, hurt journalism and hurt some of our, our, our institutions because people just, again, they don't see us being a part of the process but really just, just really explaining what's going on. So I think that there's an opportunity for journalism institutions to be a part of, again, the, the solution and helping to share the ideas that are working and so I think that that's what we're going to see happen and emerge more and more as we go forward. All right. So, Sally, I want to get back to you. I, I'm, I hope I'm not over-interpreting uh, our panels. But what I've heard is that, uh, um, look, as grave as things are, um, liberal society, that is uh, uh, with uh, sort of open, transparent, uh, well-informed citizens, with enlightened, responsible corporations and NGOs, can, uh, in lots of incremental ways, uh, uh, a, a private sector company uh, like Andreas is using um, um, uh, its levers uh, to uh, to improve things in certain ways. Journalists highlighting uh, solutions and remedies. Uh, NGOs and others uh, uh, working on worker training and, and um, mm-hmm. uh, responding to uh, uh, and integrating uh, refugee flows. That all that effort, w- like things will be okay. Um, <laughs> and yet. Uh, uh, Compared well, to the reality of what you described, a, a planet that's liber- literally melting, uh, you, you wonder whether sort of liberal incrementalism is up to the task. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I want to loop in on the positive. You Please. know, you were saying <laughs> more positive. Yes, I wasn't trying to make you the, the resident <laughs> pessimist here. I, it, yeah. it was my, how I heard you. No, but in the particular, you know, climate change issue that I'm involved in, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, said that the ice shield could restore naturally if we stay at 1.5 Celsius and do not go over. That is very positive. There are things that can be done. We need to correlate, for example, the emission reductions from private and public sector with how fast and how deep do they need to be in relationship to how fast we're losing the ice shield. Believe it or not, that hasn't happened. And believe it or not, there are not climate models out there that show that. And that's one of the things that we're doing um, so that we can show governments uh, and private sector what their efforts will actually do. When when we look at Biden said something very interesting um, a few weeks ago, he said, show me your budget and I'll show you your values. Mm -hmm. And when you look at um, the United States budget and how much we spend on the military, uh, something like 15 trillion dollars annually. Uh, more more than uh, Russia, more than anybody else does, and 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 we also have twenty some twenty one billion in subsidies to the fossil fuel 
industry with only 0.078% to um, renewables. So, you know, it, it, we have to look at where, where are our values? Is climate insecurity going to shift us fast enough, you know, that we start taking what you were talking about in journalism, transparency, accountability, um, you know, what really matters, a sports, um, a big sports stadium or protecting natural systems that are our life support systems. So we have to come to some really, and and incrementalism at this point in time, we have to work locally with a global objective. So I would suggest in jobs and skill sets, how to repair, how to restore uh, um, nature-based solutions mangroves, forests, uh, wetlands, how, how do we repair those? We can reduce by 50, not 50, sorry. I think it's 35% if we restore what we've already destroyed. Regen agriculture, all of these are, you know, are solutions along with technology, CCS, putting the carbon back back in from, um, uh, from, from coal-fired power plants or CO2. Private industry came up at the last COP meeting for 30% reduction in methane, which is fabulous. All of this has to be done. However, however, we have eight years left to make a measurable difference in where this planet is going to go in the future, both politically, climate security, food, all of it, fresh water, all of it. We have that much time and governments have to step up because they have the regulatory power and they have the budgets and they can call the shots in a lot of cases, whether we like it or not. So we have to organize at a level that we, that humanity has not had to cooperate before. We have to move from competition to cooperation. We have to move from hoarding to abundance. That mindset, we have these, we have been operating under false um, uh, assumptions, if you will. So and those Mira, let me then take that uh, Mira, the, the, that vision of uh, moving from competition to to cooperation. It seems we're rather far from that. Uh, and you know, just to bring this back, I, I don't want to get too far afield from our title. Um, uh, to, to Ukraine really highlights the fact that uh, uh, old fashioned military power still matters, uh, yeah. and uh, we are indeed um, uh, in. Uh, um, in old fashioned competition, the, the, this, uh, this new, more uh, cooperative world, which is, seems likely to be the only way we'll solve these prob- uh, the long term ecological crisis, uh, it, it just seems very distant. Uh, and, and we're not going to be spending less money on military, probably in Western budgets in the next couple of years ahead. So we're going to be spending more uh, right. in response to Ukraine. Uh, Mira, co- comment on what you've heard and, and, and what things stimulate you. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, during the time of the major conflicts, uh, like we see it now, for example, between two systems and between two worlds, uh, people, they care about the basic things, and they are forgetting about the future. They can only plan short-term, maximum, little bit mid-term. Uh, that's why, in my view, first, uh, this uh, uh, conflict should be over. After that, we can discuss uh, to the climate change issues uh, and uh, other things which will save our, our world in the long-term perspectives. Because people, like it's happened with coronavirus, with COVID. Everybody was crazy with about COVID till 24th of February this year. On the 24th of February, the tension switched to the war. Everybody forgot about COVID. Even my personally, for almost two years, every day I was checking COVID statistics for the world. And after 24th of February, I started to check the reports from, from the world. Uh, that, that's why I fully agree with Sally that uh, uh, this is uh, what we need to do. Uh, we need to cooperate to save our world. But first, we need to remove the problems which we have now. And all efforts should be now 
allocated for this. For this, this is. Uh, uh, otherwise, we cannot plan anything, even nor for business, uh, nor for geopolitics, nor for anything. So I just want to say this: this is definitely, definitely the conundrum. We will have a truce at some point in the Ukraine. We don't have a truce with nature. Nature doesn't wait for humans to resolve their relationships. Nature is marching on. And so if we don't step up to that, no matter what sector we're in, work on all these other things. But, but climate, I have to make the case, is now the number one for all of humanity. You know, and when I think of the little, the, the innocents are the ones who, who get hurt the most, the children and the wildlife and all the other creatures that we share. They're the ones that are subjective to our wisdom or our ignorance. Yeah. So we have a huge, we're being invited, if you will, to step up in a way that humanity has never done before, never had to do. COVID gave us a little preview of the fact that we're one humanity. From my point of view, uh, and, and, and looking at Ukraine, nothing is separate from anything anymore. You know, nothing is separate. And I think that one of our biggest existential risks is, yes, climate change, yes, the threat of nuclear war, but I think the biggest one is the illusion of separation, yeah. that we are separate from nature and we are separate from each other, and we're not. So we are we nature. Got, we're one humanity. We've got just a couple of moments, and I want to bounce off um, that comment um, <laughs> uh, to uh, um, uh, ask people if, as you say, the, the the Ukraine conflict at some point is going to resolve. Not clear how, but do people see the possibility? of a, uh, um, a, a, a chastened Moscow, perhaps uh, uh, Putin chastened or, or even removed from power. Is there any chance that do people feel that we'll come out of this conflict um, in better position to address some of these long-term uh, challenges uh, than, than before? Or, or is that just looking for some way to say the glass is half full um, um, against all the evidence? <laughs> What's the future of of the Western conflict with with, uh, with Moscow? Um, and are we going to be feeling better about where we are a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now? Do you think? Um, and, and we'll just go clockwise again as before, and then I think that's probably going to take us right to the end. Uh, we've got just okay. a couple of minutes, so do be uh, to be brief. But but go ahead. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, Jane. Okay. Well, I sitting here. I, I so much to think about. I feel like I'm in a parallel universe. I feel like I'm facing backwards and seeing pandemics, plagues, and land borders being protected. Like this is my space and you can't come in it. We've seen that historically for millennia, but I also feel like I'm, I've, we've been looking forwards and saying, well, this is where we have to go. If we keep repeating past behavior, we will keep reaping the past horrors that we've already been we have to figure out a way to collaborate, to communicate, tap into our empathy. And I know these may sound like soft skills. Soft, these are our hard skills right now. What we used to think of as soft skills, kindness, empathy, collaboration, relationships, communication. These are our hard skills because we are not excelling in any of those areas as we sit. And I, I, I can only imagine it's going to take every single one of us at a local level to get really fired up. We're fighting things in the United States, as, you, as everyone knows, that we thought we'd fought 50 years ago and put to bed. Clearly not. So we have to figure this out through our leadership, our communities, our government, and locally with every single one of us. And it's a huge task, but let's pray to goodness that we are up for it. Okay, good. Thank you. Andreas, we're past time, but we're going to go over just a little bit over to make sure. Sure, a gets absolutely. So, I, unfortunately, I, I don't think that we will come out of this Ukraine situation in a better shape than, than we went in before. I think that's Western world wishful thinking. Um, I, I've seen, as I said, I, I grew up uh, very close to the, to the Russian and to the Russian army. I, I, I don't think that system change is, is coming. 
And taking into consideration what uh, Sally made the point in, in, in terms of the, the environment, unfortunately, there are big parts of the continent, or not just of the continent, but of the world are covered by Russian territory. And I do, don't see any efforts that, that they make a, make a change to the positive, to the positive way. So I, I have to say, for me now, looking what we can do is, I believe we have to make sure that we, first of all, educate our people in the Western world, in the transatlantic setting, because that's the only positive which comes out of this conflict for me, that finally we realize that the transatlantic relationship is important and that we have a stronger one where we can move things forward, because that, I think, was not the case before, driven by, by the Europeans who have the issues with, with the U.S., but also with the previous administration here in, here in the U.S. And I think that's the only positive. And, and I think that's what we have to use to strive and to tackle these these uh, these problems. I could go on and on, but I think we have no time. Got him. You know, I we, we note that with reference to the previous administration, I think we're going to get all the way through the panel and with a specific name not mentioned. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, moments. But, um, uh, Matt, what do you think? Here, just our, our final summary uh, comments. Um, I think we were moving toward this conflict. I think this had to happen. I think that this is part of an ongoing process. I think that we will come out of it uh, at least with some, at least being able to say that we can turn a page. What that page, uh, that next page will look like, we don't know. Uh, I like to remain optimistic, uh, but I do think that this conflict that we're facing now and where we are right now, uh, we were coming to this and to this inflection point, and it was going to. And so it's, it's it's good to see that it is occurring, and I'm hopeful for what the future will bring for us going forward. My my connection went a little weak there, but uh, if you're hearing me, is Alec good? Okay. I'm sorry, my question has been a little erratic this morning. Um, but the, uh, uh, you know, I missed you at the last little bit of yours, but uh, we're going to finish with Sally and, and Murat, if that's okay. Yes, yeah, Sally, please, please. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, you know, I, I don't disagree with anything anything that's been said. And I, I actually am very positive and I want to bring up one other piece of this and that's women. Uh, women are really going to be influential, not just in the Ukrainian situation. I helped actually a young woman uh, with an eight year old child. I gave her some money and advice and et cetera to get out of Ukraine. She was the executive director of uh, Zero Waste Ukraine. And I learned a lot about the silent victims uh, of, this, um, of this conflict uh, from her point of view, as far as nature goes and the biosphere reserve being totally on fire. You can see it from space and, and all of that. And so, so, um, but in speaking with her and other Ukrainian women, and also I had an opportunity to sit with Syrian women, uh, who had escaped and they were in Jordan and I was in Jordan. Um, and, and it's, it's just remarkable these women, what their resilience is, and also they're naturally cooperative, which is very interesting, and they're collaborative, and they have, I guess because we're child bearers, we have more of a whole system understanding. It's not even spoken about whole systems. And that's another piece where we're going to, we're going to have to move into whole systems decision-making because just like with the Arctic ice shield it is connected to all the other climate systems, major systems on the planet, everything is connected. And so we're at, we are at an inflection sure. point where we're actually, being invited to move into this new space so that we actually survive, survive all this and come out flourishing. Mar Marat, you're going to get the last word here. Um, um, walk us through. I, I will. Out. Yes, John. Uh, I will try to be not very pessimistic, but uh, with regards to the war, first question, when this war will be over? 
unclear for now. It could go for months, it could, book, could go for years. Uh, it could be positioned in war for even longer time. Uh, second question, what will be the results from this war? Uh, and this is more or less clear. Uh, at least in my idea, in my in my theory, it will be like zones on influence and so on. Uh, but uh, the main thing, nobody will gain from this war at the end. And uh, in uh, combination with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, I think the world will be 20 to 30 years back. More or less, we'll come back to somewhere 1990 or 1991 in the globalization process. Of course, uh, climate change... Uh, issue became very important. That's why it, this will develop. But for other things which we need to do to save and help our world, we will be back like more or less 30 years. Good. Uh, on that wow. note, thank you so wow. much. I'm going to wrap up with just a comment. Uh, late in his life, uh, the, the great historian Arthur Schlesinger Jr., I got to know um, rather well late in his life. And he, uh, uh, he would often describe his philosophy, his worldview as a short-term pessimist, long-term optimist. And uh, that sounds pretty good to me. I do. In the near term, there are a lot of problems yeah. uh, that justify pessimism. Mm -hmm. We can only hope that uh, over the long term, uh, free societies and enlightened uh, individuals um, uh, uh, will uh, summon the effort to to address these these uh, uh, these these long term concerns and, and move to a world uh, defined not by uh, destruction and competition between systems, but by uh, the revitalization of the planet and by, uh, which is only going to be uh, take place in a, in a cooperative atmosphere. So anyway, that's something to wish for. And maybe I'll, that's a note to end on. Thank you all so much. I sure appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Nice Bye. to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Yes. Thank yes. you. Nice to Thank meet you. you. Great Thank job. You. Thank you.